What would inspire an award-winning Christian singer to start writing songs about Jerusalem, about Isaiah 53, the return of Jewish exiles to the land of Israel, and to do this alongside some of Messianic Jewish music's most prominent artists, and even to participate in Torah Club? We'll find out today on Messiah Podcast with our guest, Aaron Schust, a much-loved Christian singer and songwriter. Messiah Podcast is brought to you by Messiah Magazine, a free publication available in print or online at messiahmagazine.org. Put your hand and mine together. We will walk in harmony. Let me introduce you to my teacher, the rabbi from the Galilee. Welcome to Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. My name is Damien, and I am joined by my co-host, Jacob Franzak. Welcome, Jacob. What's up, Damien? How's it going? Oh, good, man. Who are you, Jacob? Well, I'm a staff writer and editor for First Fruits of Zion, which means that usually other people write things and I just make them pretty. So I have my <laughs> hands in a lot of different projects just at the polishing level. And that means I get to read everything a little bit early, so uh, I get to be ahead of the curve a little bit. He's selling himself short. Uh, if you've been around First Roots of Zion, you know Jacob's work. He has done great writing for us. He's also a pastor. He's also uh, has an MDiv. I'm not sure what that means, but I think it makes you very smart. Well, it's a master of divinity, which sounds really impressive, but basically what it means is they didn't see my family for three years. <laughs> I am incredibly excited to have you uh, as uh, we're, we're, a, we're a team for season two. We are getting ready to kick off uh, a great season of Messianic Jewish education and guests and discussion. So glad to be glad to be on the journey with you, my friend. Me too. Dream team, baby. That's it. Today, we're, we are welcoming uh, probably our most, yeah, probably our most well-known public figure to Messiah podcast thus far. Anyone who's been around Christian music for any period of time will remember a song called, My Savior Loves, My Savior Lives, My Savior is Always, right? Know that song? Oh, yeah. That's oh, Aaron yeah. Schust, who is our guest today. Man, that's fantastic. I mean, if you know, even if you hadn't heard his name, you've heard his music. He's been yeah. all over the Christian airwaves. Uh, yeah, for a long time. He's the real deal. 2005, I remember being introduced to Aaron Schust. We'll talk about that when we get with him, though. But you know what? We're talking about something really interesting, a uh, little bit different than you might expect in talking with Aaron. We're talking about Torah. We're talking about the Jewish people. We're talking about understanding the scriptures in a profoundly new way as he um, has dug in, been to Israel, and it's just been a pretty transformative thing. And uh, we're, you know, we're going to see a new side of Aaron Schuss today. Yeah, this has sort of happened under the radar. If you hadn't been paying real close attention, you might not have noticed, but he's writing songs with a little bit of Hebrew lyrics. He's performing in Jerusalem with Messianic Jewish artists. And we're going to talk to him a little bit today about how that happened, what turned him uh, on to this, this uh, Messianic viewpoint or, or post-supersessionist viewpoint. Um, how did this happen? And we'll, we'll probably throw in a few things about music, so... You know, since oh, yeah. he's a musician, we all love music. All right, We're all so musicians this is, here. This is going to be a good time. Let's get it started. If you want to know the Jewish Jesus, don't miss out on a free subscription to Messiah Magazine, where you'll discover his life and teaching, learn about the biblical festivals, and get connected with Israel. Subscribe for free at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is a free, donation-supported quarterly publication of First Fruits of Zion. Welcome to Messiah Podcast. We are very happy to welcome Aaron Schust. Aaron, good to have you with us today from Nashville. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you. 
I've, uh, you don't know this, but I've actually known you since 2005, uh, through, through, through my introduction to your first sort of groundbreaking hit that everyone knows Aaron Schust for my savior, my God, you've certainly done a lot, a lot since then, but hard to believe that was 17 years ago. What's ironic is I was playing that in a messianic Jewish synagogue as a worship leader. No way. And now... Here we sit talking to you about Messianic Judaism and Torah. So, man, God is God is cool. He does cool things. <laughs> Talk about understatements. God is very cool. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah. that's a what a cool story to hear. Uh, didn't expect to hear that one. That's awesome. Well, we're looking forward to talking about all that kind of interesting stuff today. Torah, Torah study, your music career, your life, where God's leading you, all kinds of good things. Beautiful. Jacob is my co-host. What's up? Jacob, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. When did you um when did you get started like being a congregational worship leader? Uh before I recorded anything that uh, is worth listening to. Um you know, we all have uh, as artists, we all have art that we have to process through that we really hope that nobody ever experiences, not even our own family. Um, so got a oh, lot yeah. of those things. Uh, but I right. think, I mean, I graduated from college in 98 um, and stayed in the little town of Northeast, in Northeast Georgia, Toccoa Falls, where I graduated mm. and started a little, little uh, band and we would just play at local coffee houses. And I think besides graduating with a degree in music education, it's so all the theory and history and stuff that goes into music. I think the, uh, you know, just working with a band, working with four other guys and trying to hash out, here's the drum part that I think needs to happen here. And not wanting to micromanage, of course, allowing them. I'm not a drummer, um, but I have this idea of what a good rhythm might be. And so suggesting things to the drummer. And then I think that those things definitely um, equipped me to take my first job as a worship leader in Atlanta, Georgia, um, Perimeter Presbyterian uh, Church. Wow. And... Uh, Man, it was, a, it was a larger church. I had, um, I didn't have a degree in, in, I'm not even sure degrees in worship music existed in the late nineties. I'm sure they did somewhere, but they weren't, they weren't ubiquitous yet. And so I felt like they took a, they took a stab at hiring some guy, some 24 year old kid. I remember having a problem in my own heart, like giving advice to 40 year old expert electric guitar players, for example. You know, oh, yeah. and just not wanting to do it. And my boss had to take me aside and said, listen, I know you're new to this adult thing, but this is your job. And <laughs> we hired you and is. you're and you're supposed to be good at it. And so you need to lead. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that was hard for me because it felt like it felt disrespectful to suggest that he consider something different when he was playing music before I was born, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was that was new for me. And I, I think the the recording of these songs that I began, the the, the, the album that you referenced, uh, anything worth saying that I released in 05. I actually, actually made it in 04 and just sold it in my church bookstore. And it was, it came out of me writing songs for offerings, writing songs yeah. for like offertories or Wednesday night. I remember one was called Give It All Away. And it was a Wednesday night, um, like a college ministry thing. And they, they needed songs that fit the, the um, they were doing a message on surrender. So of course I chose I Surrender All and we, we learned a version of that, which was nice. And I was kind of having a hard time coming up with more surrender songs. I'm in the camp now where as long as you have one poignant song in the worship set, it's probably great. You don't need to have six poignant worship songs all on the same topic. Oh yeah. Um, but anyhow, I wrote a song called Give It All Away about surrender. And so I was just amassing these little songs that weren't recorded anywhere, playing them in offertories and one of the, one of the, uh, guitar players um, said, man, I've always had a dream of building a studio in my basement. It was one of those like field of dreams moments. If I build it, will you come? <laughs> yeah. like, I, I don't write songs, but I want to build a studio. So we, we teamed up together and recorded that first album in his basement. And my goal really? was to give a copy to my mom. And then it started sounding <laughs> really good. And I'm like, oh, maybe we should make a couple copies and sell them in the bookstore. And I remember, oh, I remember, I remember the point in the whole recording process where I got a little scared again and thought, this sounds good enough to be critiqued. <laughs> this mm. sounds good enough for people to start voicing their opinions. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that. I'm not sure mm -hmm. this is supposed to be a holy thing. This is supposed to be a, a sacrifice of praise. And, uh, and so I had to work through that. But um, and I've, I think after all these years, my, my skin's still pretty thin when it comes to people's opinions. It's hard to have your, your, your heart criticized. In essence, that's what happens when we pour out 
songs. Jacob and I also are musicians, writers, right. and, and, and just enjoy the craft. So I, just out of curiosity from a musical place, what were you always a Christian writer? Like, were you a good kind of church going young guy or what, what influenced you musically? Yeah, the church. I, I grew okay. up going to a, um, a Christian Missionary Alliance Church, CMA, in, in Western okay. Pennsylvania. My mom was in charge of the music, small little church. I think we were probably, you know, boasting about 100 people on a Sunday. Yeah. You know, maybe 150 on a good Sunday. Um, but she was always in charge of making sure that the choir had some song to sing uh, every Sunday and that the, the offertory was always a performance piece, whether it was piano or a solo or something. And every once in a while, yeah. she'd put her little four-year-old son, Aaron, up on stage to sing a little song that we practiced during the week. <laughs> and so I right, think, um, like, I don't remember stage fright. I, I have it today because there's something always that should be frightening about walking out on stage and performing, especially when ministry is involved. When when I take it very seriously when it comes to whether it's leading worship at a at a service where worship is part of the itinerary, or whether yeah. it's a concert where I want the songs and I want the atmosphere to be worshipful. Right. There's uh, there's something, and and those are slightly different in their in their. I hate to say presentation, but for lack of a better word, they're, they're slightly different. For example, if I'm leading worship, I, I don't like to tell stories. Like, I like to read scripture. Um, if it's a concert, I might tell some stories, read some scripture, and then play the song. Right. Um, yeah, but there's a, is a, to answer your question, the church, the church is where it, it was, it was definitely formed. After this, after this career, which is obviously still ongoing, all of the songwriting, all of the live performance, everything you've done, musically what inspires you these days i'm I, these are only curiosity questions yeah. we haven't even gotten to any theology yet we're just right i love i love the music of the world and uh like even just last night i was enjoying and trying to expose my boys to uh to bossa nova from brazil and listen to some, some cuban some cube like there's so many different I, like i don't know enough about the cuban like i heard a, a song that i knew was cuban but i didn't know what genre within the Cuban genre it was. And I, I, I think it's fascinating that there are, like to tell my boys that, hey, not everybody on this planet enjoys what you call pop music. You know, right. so like, and so I've, I've always thought, at least the past few years, you know, we do such a good job, for example, around the Christmas time, whether or not you celebrate Christmas, like listening to the classics and certain, actually some of my favorite music to listen to in, in December is, uh, is the music from like five, six hundred years ago? Some of the more liturgical old um, Christmas songs that no one about about the birth of the Messiah that no one would recognize as a Christmas carol. You wouldn't yeah. confuse that with a Bing Crosby standard. Uh, mm. But they're, they've you know like uh, O Manu Mysterium is all in Latin. It talks about the great mystery of the fact that out of all the creatures of the world to witness the birth of the Messiah, it's the animals. Who got to be first like that's a it's a beautiful song it's a gorgeous song yeah. i sang it yeah. in high school and college i love it um but we do such a good job at that season and then we've got 11 months of like listen to whatever you want to so i said let's just pick certain sounds and songs um and so we're in the month of march right now and in months the month of march in the shoes house is all things celtic whether it's scottish or irish or a hymn or some some dirge from or some uh, some like bar song from the chieftains that's like a celebratory thing it's just all things celtic and then we switch things up to baroque um in in april and then we got like hawaiian music in may and, and man i you know, love it re reggae and and even a little bit of uh yeah appalachian music in the summertime because it just feels hot some johnny cash thrown in there and so i try to get a, a collection of all and i think all of those things eventually influence the sounds of what i distill into a song of my own you know well, that, that brings up an interesting perspective because somewhere along the way, in terms of listening to music of the world, um, you have developed a perspective which has led to a, a pretty strong connection to Israel and the Jewish people, and even of late, some messianic collaborations with some of uh, messianic Judaism's artists. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're buds with our bud, Joshua Aaron, right? Yeah, he's my nearest and dearest. I was just uh, already today. I've had multiple conversations with him this morning. Uh, yeah. Where he's he's doing a new project coming up um, at the Garden Tomb, and I've written with him three of the songs that are going to be performed. One that's already been released. Um, 
I don't want to give too. I want to let too much out of out of the bag. That's his to let out. But there's two songs that we wrote that are pretty pretty special, and they're all in Hebrew. Um, cool, man. And so I'm thinking, like, I don't know, but maybe maybe my audience, um, whatever my audience is, could could handle that, or maybe they need to handle that in the near future. But right now, I feel like he's got this audience who wants these. Uh, these songs in Hebrew, and it's it's a joy for me to kind of mine. Well, I'll, I'll give you this one of the one of the songs we wrote. I'll give you a little story behind it. Um, is, uh, is is the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew? Avinu Shabbat Shalom. Yes, yes, yes. We were just calling it Avinu. Um, uh, my my Hebrew is still not yeah, totally cool. sharp, but I'm working on it. I just got to possessives today in Duolingo. That's a, it's a oh, nice. excellent, excellent. <laughs> Um, but it was right before the right before the, the world shut down. It was January 2020, and it was late mm-hmm. at night after midnight. And I was in his music music house overlooking the Sea of Galilee at night. Mm-hmm. And I knew we wanted to try to write the Lord's Prayer. And I had this. I was just trying. I was searching for some some. I'm sitting here in front of my piano, just searching for some kind of sound, some kind of direction. And I I think I recently rewatched Schindler's List, and I had this mm. this hypothetical idea this. Like, what if, what if there was this deleted scene um, and, and in, the, in the corner of some, um, in the corner of Auschwitz, uh, on a Shabbat, um, there was this group of Messianic believers in my hypothetical fantasy imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And in addition to the candles and the blessings, they also sang the Lord's Prayer of their Savior, Yeshua. What would that sound like? What would that song sound like um wow and so it's not been recorded yet but he's going to perform it at the at the garden tomb um coming up on april 4th and i'm going to oh, be man. there to uh to be a part of it and to whatever degree and i'm looking forward to oh so you're going you're, yeah. you're going to be oh wow that's, yeah, they that's just not changed far some, away some of the uh the entry rules for vaccinations and i i get to i get to go lord willing awesome hey, i can't i can't wait to hear that you know what the the, the music um, I think I, I already told you that my mom part of her job was choosing songs to be performed every every week and and I think yeah. she just had a love for uh, the Hebrew scriptures I remember she made a, a to scale large but to scale model of the tabernacle one time for the, the high school project and like it, I didn't know this that like it's seemingly at least I don't make a, I want to make a general blanket statement but most evangelical churches. Um, spend most of their time in the New Testament, which is fantastic, uh, but ignoring uh, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, as I'm trying to refer it to as now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and my mom was not one of those people, and she she embraced the whole the whole story. And so the sounds, the songs that would occasionally play through uh, my home as a child, as my mom was selecting songs for the upcoming. Uh, adult cantatas in September and the, uh, the Christmas cantatas, um, uh, songs that like there was this one called "The Last Sacrifice," and mm. uh, just, um, I just I think we had a Jews for Jesus record, and I just and I remember hearing and I just wanted like I I knew Elvis Presley, I knew the Beatles, and I knew Yeshua Hamashiach has come to like it was just <laughs> one of those songs that was in my head, yeah. it was in my Rolodex, yeah. and wow. um, it was so hearing the word Adonai is not strange to me, mm-hmm. but. Um, uh, and maybe we can talk more about how, but it, it, it was not on my radar until just a few yeah. years ago again. Yeah, yeah. Well, what happened to bring it onto your radar? Because I remember, you know, in 2006, I wasn't even listening to like Christian radio, kind of like you. I liked to listen to a bunch of different stuff. I was doing church music, but I didn't want it to be like super derivative, you know? So I wanted yeah. to get lots of sounds in my head, lots of instruments, lots of styles. And despite the fact that I wasn't listening to Christian radio, I think I heard my Savior, my God, about 300 times that year. Like, <laughs> it was playing in the gas station or whatever. Like, it was everywhere. But since then, since then, like, there's been this shift. And it's it's clear in your, in your music. And uh, I don't know if the beard and growing the hair out is part of it or whether you're just, like, a trendsetter in that respect as well. But was there a time, like, was there something that happened in your life? Did you encounter a person or a Bible verse? Like what? What occasioned this sort of uh, new emphasis in your in your faith and in your songwriting? The year that I uh, was releasing it was 2016. The year that I was releasing "Ever Be," which I did not write. That comes from Bethel Church out in California. Um, mm. A song that I, I fell in love with, um, primarily because the the chorus was hooky and poppy, but the 
verses were really profoundly deep. You know, your love yeah. is devoted like a ring of solid gold and mentions covenants and promises. And I'm like, this is, this has got some theology to it. So I was in the process of releasing that. I was invited to be on the, the Caleb Bible tour where they were taking the scenes from the Bible miniseries. It was sponsored by the Bible miniseries people. And, and they were putting a bunch of artists on stage. It's cool. They told us what songs we would sing and they told us when we would sing them. And they, it basically showed the Bible on the big screen from Genesis to Revelation. It was pretty cool. Nice. Uh, and so before that, um, they wanted to send some of the artists to Israel to, uh, to capture some video, uh, but also for us to catch some vision and be able to communicate what we saw. I'd never been to Israel before, so I jumped at the opportunity. My wife was this able was to come This was 2016, with me. right? Yes, yes. So okay. January, right. the very end of January 2016. Okay. Um, and I think, and I, I've been back seven times since then. So this is visit number one. And it was just, I mean, I'd been like, like my ministry in my, in my mind was East Africa. I'd been to East Africa three times and just fallen in love with the people there and still uh, love what's happening in, in the church in East Africa. Um, but things shifted and all of a sudden I was like, I don't, I don't even want to go on vacation to Rome or Paris or London or Fiji anymore. Like just t take me back to Israel as much as possible because when you believe this, when you believe the Bible that's in my hand here, um, not to mention the fact that it's just a gorgeous place. Like I fell in love. My first visit was the shock and awe visit of like, this is gorgeous. I love the food. Mm -hmm. The palm trees are incredible. And I walked where Jesus walked. That was like the summary of my emotions, except for the fact that there was one guy who was on this small tour of like eight people with us. And he was a cinematographer capturing video. David Kern, who's become a dear friend, spoke with him this morning as well. Um, and while he was sitting in the row in the little bus behind us, a little van. And every time we would stop by a site and our tour guide, who's not a follower of Yeshua, a great guy, he would tell us about what happened. Here, if you look to your left, you'll see um, there's some, some vineyards up on these hills. This is in uh, the West Bank. You can see they're in the distance. And he would finish. He put his CB down. And David Kern would, would sneak up behind us between my wife and I with his Bible and said, what he didn't tell you was in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31, it says this is going to happen in the last days. The mountains of Judea and Samaria will once again overflow with wine. And I'm like, oh my word. And he was just, every single stop, he was revealing to us how prophecy is being fulfilled. And I think um, without really verbalizing it, it just reminded me what I already knew, that God was real. God is not a God of just the past, but the present and the future. He's got a plan. He's got a plan for Israel. It's happening. It's continuing. All these things that I've always believed as foundational, but never really spent much time thinking about, got pushed to the front burner in my heart and in my mind. Yeah. And, and I wonder how many Christians have that perspective they, right. they they just know that israel is where jesus was right yes and i i tell people to embrace that yeah you know of course embrace, embrace that go yeah but just don't but don't forget that it's not just where jesus walked it's where he will walk again yeah. um you know he's got promises and we we cling to many of them and we forget that there are uh, uh, quite a few promises that are yet to be fulfilled but we're seeing them be fulfilled in our day and that's exciting so i think my, my second visit i i knew i didn't want to just be a, a, a tourist again mm -hmm. i wanted to dig deep with some relationships and and uh one of those relationships was with um Chaim mailspin with the alia return center and i met him in the lobby of a uh, I was actually with, I'm skipping over the whole Joshua Aaron story. We met just because I started listening to his music because I started mm -hmm. trying to, my best to, to keep the Sabbath. And I needed, I already told you I have a playlist for every month. I needed a playlist for the, for the Shabbat. And for the first month or two, it was just Fiddler on the Roof. And nice. then I, uh, I branched <laughs> out and discovered Tradition has value. Right. Yes, yes, it does. But I just, uh, man, the music, Joshua's music just blessed us so much, and it bled over into every day of the week. And I thought, I need to encourage this guy. I just reached out to him, found his contact page, and shot him an email and said, you don't know who I am, but your music's been blessing me. And he responded, I do know who you are. We love your music, too. And we just became fast friends. Uh, and then a couple of months later, he visited the States, and we wrote a song together, None Like You, which I recorded, and we played live at the Tower of David. And we've just become dear friends. And he introduced me to Chaim Mailspin, who uh, he gave me, he showed me his card, his little business card. And it said, Aliyah Return Center. I was like, uh, what's, what's Aliyah mean? Because, well, basically, I know it means ascend, but he said, it basically means to return. It's, it's talking about the return. And I was familiar with this concept because I have, in fact, read the Bible. 
but it was again in the, in the back of my mind. Um, yeah. And like, oh, of course, like they are returning. I know about Russia and I know about the after the Holocaust and I know like, oh, so this is the fulfillment of prophecy. And it basically got to the point where I'm like, I need to read the Bible again. I need yeah. to I need to just read this again with my eyes a little bit more widely opened. And I just I, this is the copy of the one that I read through in 2017. And just I underlined completely different passages that I never paid attention to before. And yeah, and wrote Zion after after that, just the collection of all of these unavoidable promises that God continually makes over. I recently read it's the most repeated promise in the Bible that God made to Abraham and his descendants that in the last days he'll bring them back and give them this land. And yeah, I want to I want to encourage everyone on this podcast to listen to the song that Aaron just mentioned. Now, now, mm -hmm. knowing the story particularly, that song is so powerful. Heavy, heavy Praise emphasis the on the Jewish oh, people yeah. coming home. Yeah, yeah, I just I, I watched it again um, today. I think it was the live performance at um, in Jerusalem, oh. and it, and just to hear like the the words of the Shema at the end, it's like man, like I got chills. It was just beautiful. Jacob, I'm not even sure I fully recall knowing what the Shema was when I chose to put that into the song. Wow. Like, listen, I'm not trying to make this a hyper spiritual thing. Like, I, you know, the spirit wrote it. I didn't write it. Like, you know, with, with all of my flaws and stuff, I insert, I inserted things. I just, I tried to, to use as much of it from the Hebrew scriptures. I didn't even, I knew there was going to be some degree of a Jewish audience and I didn't want the whole song to be dismissed because I quoted something from Matthew. Right. Um, um, I wanted it to be from the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, but I just, I remember praying in this room, I was just praying, God, I am, I am saying your words here and I have, please don't let me misuse or misguide or be, you know, I don't want to craft, I don't want to eisegete. I don't want to craft what I'm wanting to say by using your words. So let this be true. Let this be true. Um, what a blessing it was to perform that in Jerusalem under, I'm not sure if you know this from, I mean, that's, that's open sky, the tower of David, there's no ceiling. So I was able right. to see, it was a clear night so I could see those stars as I was singing, count the stars if you can. And I knew that the sound yeah. was booming out into the streets of the old city and just let people hear this. And uh, I got I got choked up when that opened. I hear the words of your father. I got a little emotional, a little catch in my voice on the word father. Yeah, I noticed just, that. Oh. And I be <laughs> I didn't beg. I asked Joshua to take it out. I'm like, you got to fix that one. He goes, no way, man. I'm leaving that emotion in there. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. okay. Awesome. No, I thought it was really, really powerful. Yeah. Really, really good. You can get a free subscription to Messiah Magazine at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is where you'll get meaningful teaching on the roots of your faith, the biblical festivals, Israel, and most of all, you'll discover the Jewish Jesus through a Messianic Jewish perspective. Subscribe for free today at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is a free donation-supported quarterly publication of First Fruits of Zion. You said something in passing that I want to jump back to because, you know, thinking back again to playing 2005 Aaron Schust, 2022 Aaron Schust just said, well, because we started honoring the Sabbath <laughs> or like, you know, yeah. you mentioned that. Yeah. Would you, would you tell, what, what does that mean? I mean, there's a lot of people on this podcast who don't even know what that means and why you're doing it. I'm curious. I heard stories growing up that uh, after church on Sunday, everybody, you know, this is back in like the 50s, maybe. This is the little church that I grew up in, but I wasn't around in the 50s. But my grandmother, um, you know, after church, all the men would go up in the front porch and smoke their cigarettes um, after church because that was socially acceptable. But uh, on the way home, I think they would, I think my dad said he used to love it when they would stop at Dairy Queen on the way home and get an ice cream cone after church, but they had to be really secret about it because they couldn't let anybody see them eating ice cream on Sunday. So <laughs> this is the, this is the kind of the world that I grew up coming out of. And to uh -huh. me, the day of rest was, you know, wake up, get dressed, go to church, come home exhausted, watch some football, eat some leftovers, um, and probably go back to church on Sunday evening. And like mm -hmm. I, I associated the Sabbath with absolute exhaustion and doing something that I really didn't want to do. I wanted to stay home and play because I was a kid, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I was 
after my after my trip in Israel, I think it was the following Christmas, Christmas of, of 2016, that I got a, a little book from a friend, um, a fellow uh, Gentile Christian from where in Pittsburgh where I grew up, and she just knew that I had this interest, this increased curiosity, um, all things Hebrew. Um, and Israel and, and the Jewish people and culture. And so she got me this little book called Mudhouse Sabbath, which I would recommend. I've read it a couple of times. Um, I've read it. Yeah. I know it. So yeah. chapter one is, a, and so in, in general, if you're not familiar as listeners, um, this, this girl who is Jewish and she's finding herself in, I think, Virginia. Uh, and she's just surrounded by, she's a follower of Jesus. Uh, and, the, and the only place for her, I think she's saying that she can worship is a Christian church and she's loving it and she's enjoying it and community, et cetera. She's a young single girl when she writes this. But she's like, there's, like, there's some things about Judaism that I miss. There's some things that I think would actually really benefit the, the Christian evangelical community. And here they are. And then she breaks, you know, breaks them down. Uh, hospitality, fasting. Chapter one is the Sabbath. And she starts by quoting a friend of hers that talks about, this is page one, the frenzy of getting ready for the Sabbath, coming home from work, running to market to grab some food, making sure the, the tablecloth is clean and, and the flour is, is I, I, this is the image that stuck with me. Um, as the sun is setting, um, the, the light coming in and catching the, the, the petals of that flour that she just placed on the, on the kitchen, on the, on the dining room table, hurrying to take a shower and then whew, being at peace and entering the rest. And I'm like, I don't know what that is because I've never done that. Mm-hmm. But that's beautiful. I'm crying on page one, and I want that. <laughs> I want that because we're all yeah. tired, and I, I want that. And it just felt so a combination of practical, like what a fantastic idea, God, and it, and it felt holy. It was like I want, I want these things. And so, I mean, I'm a I'm a musician. I travel on weekends occasionally, so it's it's hard to always do that, and I wrestled yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, but man, when I'm home. Uh, we're trying to just mine the the heart of God in this. Um, yeah, we don't do things. We're not we're not following necessarily what um, Orthodox rabbis of today might um, demand. We use light switches, and uh, if we had an elevator in our house, we'd probably use it. But um, <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's been it's been the best thing we've done as a family in the past five years. Wow, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, it's extraordinary. What an extraordinary testimony. I mean, just something, it sounds simple and it sounds, you know, just, oh, take a day off. But when you really get into it and when you really like find the significance, the spiritual significance, but also just how good it feels to rest in God for a day. And it really needs to be a spiritual discipline. And we try to make it such like uh, little things we've picked up. I don't think we've created these ideas. I'm sure this is done. But like every every time we find ourselves, because it's, you know, it's we're crazy all week or running all over the place with school and, and whatnot. And we come together and it's like our first time to actually talk about the troubles of the week. And mm, we're like, yeah. nope, Shabbat Shalom. Right. We interrupt ourselves. Like, no, nope, we're going to lead. And here's the spiritual discipline. It's not that you can't talk about things that might be stressful. Like, I can't believe my teacher gave me a bad grade or I can't believe. It's just like we're going to we're going to leave. We're going to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. We're good. There, there, we might need to address this. We'll address it. We'll address it tomorrow night. Right. We'll address mm-hmm. it when Shabbat's over. But um, no planning. Like even it's like, oh, hey, next week spring break. What are we gonna do? Nope. Shabbat Shalom. We'll talk about it later. Let's just be at peace. What a blessing, man. Excellent. Yeah. I think uh, you know the word is to cease. Like you, we. It's always rest. But I mean, I sometimes have to remind myself that that word literally cease stop being what you are all the other days of the week which sometimes is complaining but uh you know like even some people are confused well you don't make you don't pray like you don't ask god for things on shabbat no you don't because you know usually that centers on us and it's just about him but ironically in making it about him it becomes about us which i guess is the great thing that you're experiencing as a family right it's constantly refocusing throughout the day yeah. we're constantly yeah. and you can either beat yourself up because you're not doing it right or you can realize that as humans we need to be constantly refocusing recalculating recentering mm. on on the object of our faith our provider our good yeah. king 
So I've heard, and I wanted to get this in while we have time, I've heard that this is true. Tell me if this is true. I've heard that you have participated in First Fruit Design's small group Bible study Torah club. Is that true? It is true. It is true. Mm-hmm. Um, we have. Do you done, like it? I love it. I love it. And I've been in with. Um, it's been online. It started after the the lockdown and the pandemic, and Zoom was discovered. And uh, it was with Joshua Aaron, and the, I'm the only person in the group that's not living in Israel. So there's a time change thing. But I mean, yeah. I, I I don't know. I, I'd be guessing. I, I I probably got at least forty or fifty lessons in, and then. With the time change and with things, it just it's it's not over yet. The, we're mm. clinging to hope, and we have a nice little thread going, and we're we're constantly texting each other like we need to do this again. So, um, man, the insights um, and uh, the and the, and the booklets and and what's in the videos, it's so it's so um, I don't hate to say just say good. I want to say more than that because it's it's it's. I'm sure you've all heard of the the imagery of the diamond, uh, which might have come from from old rabbinical t- uh, talks. That when you look at the, the the word of God, like it's like a diamond, you hold it at a different angle, and you can see it differently. It always looks different. It looks fresh. And so I'm looking at these same passages, but but through the context, uh, through the Jewish context, through first century context, uh, e- even being able to reference like Josephus and and other you know other historical things that we all accept as historical and, and, and fact and true to say, well, keep in mind that, you know, when, when this happened, this was what was going on. And when this happened, this is what this means. So translated into English, this means this to us, but that's not what it means in the original. That kind right. of teaching um, is so, so important. And I'm finding it in Torah Club and, and I love it. Yeah, is there is there a particular insight that has had, that you remember a, a memorable insight? I know there are a lot, but there have been like any. Can you think of one aha moment? That's kind of putting you on the spot question because there's a okay. lot of them. But yeah, let me try to think. I, the the one the, the one I keep thinking of, and I'm not. It's not. It's not a fully formed thought. But Jesus spent a good bit of time getting away from the crowds. And in John 6, when he had his hard teaching about, you know, my body is real food and my yeah, blood is yeah. real drink. And and people just peaced out. They just walked away. Mm. <laughs> Jesus turned to his disciples, do you want to leave too? What, what I, and they're like, no, we're, where else would we go? You hold the, the keys to life. Um, that's, that's something that helped me through the Torah club, just realizing like, um, wow, Jesus wasn't chasing after those people. Like he said something that was offensive, misunderstood. His disciples even warned him like, hey, people didn't like that. And he's like, yeah. eh. <laughs> he didn't chase right. them down, which is what I do when I say something that's taken out of context on social media. I chase people down. Right. That's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. Come back, come back, come back. <laughs> and Jesus is like, see ya. Like right. that's, that's paradigm shifting. You know, yeah, yeah, and so I, I just feel like every every class has at least one, if not ten, mind blowing moments like that that are paradigm shifting. Cool, that's good to hear. That is very good to hear. Jesus, my rabbi, is the is the Torah yes. club that he was doing. Yeah. So I have uh, on an indus- industry level, and I know you've been you've been in the industry a long time. Hmm. Out of curiosity, your sort of awareness. Um, yeah. digging in to the to the real to the Hebrew scriptures, all of that. Has there been any what is the industry um, response or has has there been any of that? I mean, you know, you're writing differently. That that song Zion, Isaiah 53, you just did an, another song recently with Joshua Aaron. You're you're a different guy on some level. I know it's always been there because we talked about your mom putting it there and and you've developed that on your own. But any what what's your life like today in this in this world? Well, in 2018, I completed my uh, record contract with Centricity Music. I did five records with them, albums, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did not continue to move forward. And that was, uh, I have no problem saying, they have no problem saying, that was their choice. I was i was ready to move forward and to mm-hmm. renegotiate a new contract and make new music with them. And, yeah. and what, the, what all that basically means is that there's somebody who fronts the money that, that it takes to make some 
make a project and fronts mm-hmm. the money that it takes to market a project so that people besides your mom know about it. <laughs> and uh, and then you pay them back over over the course of time, depending on how quickly you sell said product. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you take that out of the equation and you you're left with the crisis of wondering, is this what I feel called to do? And the answer was mm-hmm. yes. So I had to deal with the emotions of rejection for a while. But I think it's yes. by far the best thing that could have happened. I don't know the true reason behind why um, they chose to go a different direction. And I don't spend too much time thinking about that. What's important mm. to me is that I, I believe God's placed a calling on my life. And when I rode Zion, there was never a, a hope in my mind that, oh, man, radio stations are going to play this song. <laughs> like, no one's going to play this song. I actually had a, a prominent person who had heard it, a prominent in, a, in one of the bigger radio stations. They heard this the night I debuted it. And they were like, this needs to play on our station, which that is music to any artist's ears. Yeah. Uh, and I told her in that moment, like, that's sweet. Thank you for saying that. They're not going to. They're not mm. going to. And that's okay. That's not the purpose of this. Like there's a there's a mission, there's an audience that is in the end game is not always going to be radio. I think the um I think the response of the industry, um, I would have to I would have to con- uh, speculate because it's been it's been generally quiet. And I think that means no one's come out and condemned or ridiculed and said mm-hmm. Aaron got all Jewish. Like no one <laughs> said that, but yeah. I think they've just kind of quietly walked out of the room. Mm. You, you know what I mean? Um, but, uh, the people who, um, I had one lady this past week that commented, cause I, I I'm, I, I'm in the process of recording Zion in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese. So I've, I've done the whole lead vocal. I just need to go back next month after I get back from Israel and record the background vocals, the harmonies. Cause Currently, all the harmonies are in English. That's not going to work. So, um, and she said, I love how diverse you're getting. And I like, I'm not trying to be diverse, but I'm glad you see it as that. Um, yeah. I'm not trying to reach a new audience. I'm trying to sing what's true for me. And this is what's true for me, the Word of God. Yeah. And I, um, over the course of, you know, it's interesting you said you heard you, that you were saying that you played My Savior, My God 17 years ago at a Messianic community. I love to hear that. Or a congregation. Um, I've gone back over my old songs, double checking the lyrics. Like, oh shoot, have I have I said anything in my lyrics that I regret? <laughs> um, mm. And there are a couple things that I might have said differently, uh, yeah. but nothing that I regret. Nothing that I believe was um, nothing that I think was theologically wrong. I try my best to be theologically accurate, as we yeah. all should. Yeah, for um, sure. But so it's a it's a it's a mysterious, cloudy answer to your question. Um, I, I, God's brought me different a different audience for sure. Um, but I, as I as I share and as I speak to people, I still feel my heart, my audience. I feel is is not only to to minister to people who may worship using the songs like "Mountain of the Lord" or Isaiah fifty three. Some of that is like evangelistic toward the, a Jewish person who has not accepted Yeshua. Like, hey. Look at this Isaiah 53 song. This sure sounds an awful lot like Jesus, but it's all straight from the prophet Isaiah chapter mm-hmm. 53. These are all yeah. words from that. Um, but it's also, I want it to be informative to the evangelical Gentile Christian church to say, hey, this here's, here's a verse you probably never paid attention to. Um, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord in the last days. You know, all na- the nations will say, like, that's... That's scripture. And so if we can sing Psalm 23, let's also sing Isaiah 2. Yeah. Hmm. And that's us, right? When you're singing to the when you're singing to the church about the nations going up to the Lord and, you know, celebrating Sukkot in the messianic age, like these are things that people just don't know. So, first of all, I want to I want to say thank you for I'm happy God has led you this way. I'm happy hmm. to, and thankful that you're obedient and that it's you know something that you're pursuing with passion because first of all i know the songs are great and i know they'll continue to be great as as it gets more and more um as as you draw closer and closer into it and eight trips to israel will do that to you coming up coming number eight (laughs) coming up well may the lord come back quickly and 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 stop my recording process anytime he wants um, yeah. we'll all be singing forever. And that's one of the things yeah. that I love to do. I love to, I love to try to write songs that will still be applicable a thousand years from now. 
Yeah. You know, when oh, we've yeah. been there 10,000 years from now, I, I want this. I'm not pretending to say that we're going to sing my songs, but I just want to write songs of worship. And they and, and they don't all, they're still like, I'm in the process of writing a Psalms album right now. And Psalm 51 mm. is one of the ones I chose. And that is, that is not a song that we will be singing 10,000 years from now. Um, <laughs> right. But, uh, but there's, there's something to be said for the, the songs of eternity. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I got four rapid fire questions. Let's go. The, this is what the people want to know. Uh, <laughs> favorite instrument to jam on at home? Piano. Favorite time signature? Time signature? Yeah. Always oh, probably 4-4, four, four, although I, I try to dabble with 6-8. Or tw- you know what? I like 12-8 better than 6-8. There we go. Okay. Now, uh, Phil Wickham, for his Christmas album, wore a denim jacket, a white t-shirt, and black pants. How does it feel to be a fashion inspiration to the next generation? <laughs> <laughs> that was your look in 2017, right? <laughs> See, I did it first. I did it first. Yeah, Success. absolutely. <laughs> and last question, how far do you think the Steelers are going to go this year? All the way. All the way. You heard it here first, everybody. That's, that's not even a question. Come on, Mitch. All the way. <laughs> Take us there. <laughs> well, so you said your Hebrew is, you know, you're working on your Hebrew through Duolingo. I'm, I want to encourage you to put a bunch of Hebrew in your songs. Oh, yeah. Because your audience is diverse and your audience should know the kingdom language that we're all going to be speaking in Jerusalem. So I love it. Kick love it, it, man. We'll do. We'll do. All all right. Right. I don't know, right? I need to do that. Yeah. One. So I'm that's, oh, man. You got oh, man. that one nailed down. That's a good one to know. So um, we'll look out for the garden tomb recording. Is that, oh. is it, is it going live or are we just going to, is it going to be not, it's not available okay. to watch live. He's uh, okay. going to be a live audience there, okay. uh, and then he's he's filming it, and, and I'm not sure when it's going to come out. But he uh, he moves things along, my friend Joshua Aaron. Yeah, mm. yeah he doesn't yeah. drag his feet. He's actually working on two albums at the same time because he has unlimited energy. Yeah, and he yeah. also wakes up looking at the Sea of Galilee, which is quite inspiring for songwriting. Come on, <laughs> I've done it too. Yeah, it's good. Absolutely. Well, Aaron, how can uh, how can everybody get a hold of your stuff? How can they keep track of where you are and what you're doing? How can they keep in touch with you? Thank you. Um, AaronShoes.com is a great place to start. Um, we're gearing up tomorrow. My wife and I, my, my wife is a fantastic student of the Bible, and she loves to teach the Word of God. So we'll be we'll be sitting right here. We've been doing this every Wednesday. We take, we do six six Wednesdays in a row, and then we take the seventh one off just to just breathe and reconsider a little, little uh, weekly Shabbat. Um, on mm. the larger scale, uh, but just a half hour and play a couple songs and she shares the word and we don't, we don't always know where it's going to go, but it's always a sweet time. And we've been praying over Ukraine and praying over people around the world and, uh, taking, taking prayer requests that email in and it's been, it's been sweet, but, uh, Aaron Schust yes. is a great way to start. All right. Thanks so much. You're doing that with your wife. Is that you're doing that live, like Facebook live or something? Yeah. Yeah. It's on, it's on YouTube right now. Um, okay. I need to get that little app that allows us to broadcast to multiple platforms at the same time. Maybe we'll do that, uh, in, in the fall. Uh, but awesome. right now it's on YouTube. Yeah. All right, man. Well, listen, it's been, it's been great to hang out. Um, I've Black been waiting West. 17 years for it. So, you know, I'm glad we, <laughs> glad, glad we finally got it done. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Well, God bless you guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Blessings to you. Torah Club is the world's fastest growing Messianic Jewish Bible study. You can start or join a club today at TorahClub.org. Know Jesus better through an in-depth small group Bible study and fellowship with other like-minded disciples. Start a club or join a club at TorahClub.org. Torah Club is where disciples learn. Well, Jacob, I'd say that was a pretty good way to get this season two started. Aaron Schust, very talented guy, well-established, made a lot of music, been around a long time, and yet, wow, very, very humble and very, very passionate about the journey that God has him on right now. That Israel connection is powerful. Tell me, wh- what'd you like? What was good? What, what'd you think? Oh, man, it was all good. They, they say that you should never meet your heroes, but, you know, it's been proven wrong today because I, I love this guy. I loved yeah. talking with him. It was so 
fascinating to hear because this is a journey that I've been on too. I grew up in the church, did church music for a long time before coming into contact with any any sort of like real intense um, Jewish context to the New Testament. Even yeah. like getting the MDiv didn't provide me with what, I was, what I've been able to get through um, through First Fruits of Zion. Yeah. And just to, to talk with someone else who's who's gone through the same thing. Um, it's great. It's like, it just sort of confirms this is something that God's doing all over the world. It's happening in the hearts of people everywhere. And even once in a while, a real famous guy like Aaron shoes. So yeah. God is, is moving, man. It's, it's exciting. It is. I, I've especially appreciated what I can only term the organic development of this process in him. I mean, the story about going to Israel to get introduced and get some inspiration for the song he was recording and then coming home and saying, man, like we, we were watching him, you know, we're, we're recording this on video and he like, he just sort of picked up his Bible. When he said this, he, he said, I came home and I said, man, I need to read this Bible again. Oh, and yeah. in that process, that's the time where, where that, that's the confirmation that the Bible is alive, that it's still communicating because it, it, nobody told him that other than reading through the Bible and then meeting people eventually. But I loved the fact that he just, you know, he dug in and found it and look what it's done. Look how it's transformed him. And I know we're joking in that, in the podcast about singing in Hebrew, I mean, I guarantee you, people are going to, they're going to be introduced to something messianic because of Aaron Schust and what God's doing in his life. So I loved it. Thought it was cool. Yeah. Just to see how long God had been preparing him from his mom all the way through and the transformative power of just going to Israel. And there's just something that becomes real about the New Testament once you see the places Jesus walked. Yeah. I mean, it's you can't replace that. There's no substitute. The land of Israel, the people of Israel, the scriptures of Israel. Yeah. Um, I've they heard that draw somewhere. us. They draw us to God in a way that you just there's no other there's no other way to do it. Yeah. Even even his story about, you know, palm trees and walking where Jesus walked. That that's everyone's first trip and then you go to another level. And mm. he's he's definitely gone to another level. So I'm really excited about that that uh, garden tomb thing with Joshua Aaron. That's going to be pretty powerful, I think. Looking forward to that Avinu song. Oh, absolutely, yeah. All right, that'll do it for our first episode on season two. Thanks for joining us on Messiah Podcast today. Shalom to all. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. This podcast is an extension of Messiah Magazine, available at messiahmagazine.org. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review along with a five-star rating wherever you're listening now. Today's podcast was hosted by myself, Jacob Franzak, along with Damian Eisner. Our executive producer is Boaz Michael, and the editor-in-chief is Daniel Lancaster. This episode was directed and edited by Jeremy Schoenwald. Original music was written and performed by Joshua Aaron. The show notes for Messiah Podcast were edited by Candy Bishop and are available at messiahpodcast.org. If you are interested in learning more about the Bible from a Messianic Jewish perspective, check out Torah Club, which is an international network of small study groups who meet weekly to study the Bible together from a Messianic Jewish perspective. To start a club or join a club, go to TorahClub.org. Until next time, shalom. Let his word cover you and me Like the waters cover the sea Let his love cover you and me Like the waters cover the sea